So I'm going to talk about the seven summits, hiking the seven summits, and I'm going to uh, specifically talk about my trip up Denali, which is the mountain in Alaska, and then Kilimanjaro, and then how that transitioned in the, into nonprofit work, and then plan to the future. Um, so any questions, just let me know, and I'll start. Welcome. Hi. Okay. So just about a little about me, so you kind of get a context of who I am. So I graduated in 79. We just had our lunch reunion for 40 years. Thank you. It was great. And um, what I did in 79 is I decided to stay an extra year, so I ran track in 1980. And um, it was very hard for me to leave. I don't know how you other graduates felt, but it was very difficult to leave this place because it was just home. and. Um, and I have great memories, and my daughter went here, so it was great to come back um, for her time here. Uh, so I'm 61, married to Ed, who, what's Ed? <laughs> 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 for 31 years. And I have um, two kids, Molly 26, who is out playing Frisbee, she's supposed to be here, and Ryan is 22, and he is a senior at Georgia Tech, will finish in May. And, okay, so what are the seven summits? Kylie, what are the seven summits? The seven high points of every continent. Yes, right. So, seven <laughs> continents, and they're the highest point on each one. It's not necessarily the hardest mountain to climb in on the continent, but it's just the tallest. Um, so I'll go through what the seven summits are. So this is Kilimanjaro in Africa. I've climbed it 14 times uh, between 2000 and 2019, and I have number 15 in January, and then 16 and 17 that are in the works. So I know, hopefully, maybe I'll get up to 20 before I retire from Kilimanjaro. Um, South America's high point is Aconcagua at 22,000 feet, and I did that in January of 05. Antarctica is um, the mountain of Vincent, 16,000, and I did that in January of 11. Oh, and this is our summit day picture, and it was minus 70, and that's the coldest I've ever been. And when we weren't taking pictures, you had to keep moving because despite all the clothes we had on, if you stop moving, you, you would start to get too cold. And uh, so there were three of us plus two guides that were taking the picture. Um, fourth continent, Australia is Mount Kosciuszko. It's, it's the smallest of the seven summits at 7,000 feet. And, but kind of hiking purists think that Australia is not a continent, that the continent is actually Oceania. And if you count that as the continent, then the high point is Karstens on Papua New Guinea at 16,000 feet. I haven't done that one. Okay, um, high point of Europe is Mount Elbrus at 18,000 feet. That's in Russia, Western Russia. Um, and this is our group that did it with the mountain behind us, and the other picture shows the path up there. Um, Denali in Alaska, this is what I'm going to talk about, so I'll skip over that one a bit. And then Mount Everest in Asia is the tallest in the world, and that is the one that I'm missing. I haven't done that one yet. Where is that picture? This picture is at the base camp. So I was at the base camp in 1990, and that was the Sherpa, that was my guide, and Mount Everest is right behind us. And um, so that's where they actually start the hike. So. Okay, so people say, why do you climb? So here are some of my reasons. Um, I went to Kilimanjaro with my niece, Kylie, with Ed, and my daughter, Molly. And so you get a lot of time to talk to people that you don't ever get anywhere else. And so that is probably my number one reason. Also did the John Muir Trail with my sister and my niece, and you just spend hours walking with each other. And um, I love the time that you get to talk. Also, you're in different countries, and so this is a picture of a Buddhist puja ceremony. Whenever you're climbing in the Himalayas, your guides are Buddhist, and so they do a ceremony, and they hang flags, they have incense, they have treats. And so even though I'm not Buddhist, I'm just observing the ceremony. So it's very interesting to see um, what, how the other cultures function on mountains. So
So also, every mountain has its own beauty. So this is a mountain in China, and um, it's called Choyoyu. And so you get, you get out of your tent in the morning and you just look out and nature is beautiful. Uh, this was my trip to Everest Base Camp that I talked to you about. So that was 1990. When I was back there in 2018, I got the three guides together and we did a reunion picture. And this, this guy is showing this picture. And um, this guy is now a restaurant owner in Napa. He leads treks and he's retired because he was the head guide. And back then, these two were just the porters. So everybody has done well. Are you, sorry, yeah. can I ask questions during? Yeah. Okay. So was one, were one of those guys the guys that carried you down? Is no. that a different trip? Vin, no, that's the trip. Vince has a story. Um, on no, this I don't have a story. <laughs> <laughs> no. you know. Vince, my brother, knows on this trip I broke my leg. Oh. And, oh. and so that stick that the guy is carrying, and I'm sort of holding on to him and have my arm around the other guys because I have a broken leg. And um, to get down off the mountain, my guide, who's in the orange sweatshirt, hired a porter who carried me on his back for several hours. So, yeah. And I don't, I don't have a picture of him. Okay. And the other, re for the other reasons for climbing is exercise. You know, sometimes you don't want to get out there, but if you have a mountain in front of you, then it's a motivation to keep hiking. And then, plus, it's great to be able to set a goal and to achieve a, a personal goal. So, my, my dream to climb the Seven Summits began in 82, just a couple years after um, I got out of Point Loma. And uh, my hiking partner at the time, we decided to do it over 15 years. So, from 82 to 97. And so, what what I didn't expect is this, <laughs> you know, because as you can tell, 97 was supposed to be the end, and it's 2019, and I'm still not finished. So here, let, I'll tell you a little bit about Denali, because Denali is the hardest one I've done, and um, so the guys that have done Everest, they say that Denali is colder. Everest is higher, but Denali is colder. So we experience cold. So questions about Denali, how many climbing days? 21. <laughs> oh. How many days without a shower? Ed. 21. Yeah. <laughs> so we went 21 days without a shower, and it's just hard to believe that you can do that. But you have so many clothes on, so you don't really smell yourself. The only thing I felt like was your hair is just sticking to your, you know, your head. But um, so 21 days, no shower. More questions. Uh, how many pounds to bring? I'm just going to go ahead to go through our show. We have to bring 120 pounds of stuff per person. And um, last question, how do you go to the bathroom at night? <laughs> you have a bottle that has a wide mouth. Because it's so cold outside, you don't want to get out of your tent. And um, so this is the product of the nighttime. <laughs> how many other females were on this trip? There were no other females on the trip. Um, so, did you have your own tent? No, you make a deal with your tent mate about how you're going to handle being dressed, how you're going to handle going to the bathroom. And here's Molly. Molly. Did you have help carrying it? Was that on your back? Yes. Um, I'll talk about that. Um, but yes, I did have help. Okay. So this is our team. Um, you have to weigh in everything. That's me in the red jacket because you're taking these small planes onto the mountain, so they weigh you, they weigh everything you bring, and then you you hop on these planes and you fly to the Alaska Range, and this is what you're going to land on. So your uh, landing strip is the glacier, and the planes are equipped with skis on the bottom. This is the trail map that you're taking, the, the route up um, Denali. So you land on the glacier, and then you start to uphill, and you have a wall right here. This is the tough part right here, and then you're on the ridge all the way to the top. How long a distance is that? Um, good question. I'm going to estimate it is 20 miles from 
airport or the landing to the top. What's the summit height? It's 20,320. But um, you're going up so slowly that by the time you're getting up there that you're completely used to the altitude. So there's no oxygen? No, you don't need oxygen. Okay. Yeah. Because with the 21 days, you're fine yeah. with that amount of time. So this is answer to your question. How many times do you hike? You hike, you have to actually hike the mountain twice because you have 120 pounds and it would be impossible for me to carry up 120 pounds even if I had it divided between a backpack and a sled. So what we do is you take 30 pounds on your back, 30 pounds in your sled, you walk up to your next night's camp and you bury it six feet deep. And then you mark the top of one so you can find it the next day. So after you bury it, you walk back downhill with your sled. And the reason you bury it is because there are very smart ravens that come up on the mountain and they can dig. If, if you left your, your bag on top of the snow, they could peck their way through it and eat all your food. So you have to bury it deep enough that they can't dig it out. Um, so now we're low in the mountain, we're 9,000 feet, and you can see it's kind of very calm. It's flat, there's stuff spread out on the snow, so it's kind of a very relaxed camp. And, um, but now we're, we're up to 14,000 feet, and this is where you can get in trouble with weather and storms coming in. So it takes us four hours to make a camp. So what you do is that picture over there, you smooth out snow, and then you do a quarry where you start to cut ice blocks because you're starting to build a wall around your tents. And this is what it looks like when you're done. Your tents are behind walls front and back so that if a storm comes in, the wind's not gonna come in under your tent and blow it up and off the mountain. So you've hiked up here. This, if you can't move into a camp that's already established and you have to make your own, then after your hike, you've gotta spend four hours making it. Um, one great thing, you know, the bathroom is probably the worst thing about a hike like this. <laughs> the best thing is, oops, I went too far, is the food. When you're walking, you have to be able to eat 500 calories an hour. So you stop every hour and you've got to get in 500 calories uh, as quickly as you can because you don't want to stop too long. And then you're just kind of gorging yourself at the meals when you're in camp. So we have pizza, this is pancakes and bacon. <laughs> Um, oh wait, going on it. Food, all right. Um, the temperature <laughs> swings are dramatic. In the tent, like this picture was minus 15 degrees and that's me in my sleeping bag. And then um, this watch is showing positive 68 because when the sun is out and it's beating on the tent, it can get really hot in there. So you're taking off all of your layers and you're opening up the window. Um, and so you're kind of basking in the warmth on a day like that. Okay, so the trail up the mountain. So this is low on the mountain. You're on the relatively flat, gradual up glacier. And then you can see here, we're gonna hit a camp right here, and then we've got a hill there the next day. What time of the year was this? Uh, time of year, it was May. May okay. The climbing season on Denali is sort of mid-May to the end of June, so just about six weeks. Because it's too cold before mid-May, and then um, July 1st, the monsoon storms start coming. <coughs> Um, so here on the glacier, we have, we're roped up all the time. We're watching for crevasses, which are the um, uh, caves in the snow where the glacier is separating. And it's, when it's sunny, you have to have lots of sunscreen and it can be very hot. So now we're above that camp. We're coming up that hill. You can see our sleds are behind us and we're marching in a line because we're tied into a rope so that if someone falls into a crevasse, the other people can lay down on their ice axe and prevent the rest of the group from going into the crevasse. Looking back, that's where our plane had taken us down here. So we have walked all the way up the, the glacier there. Uh, this is 11,000 feet camp going up uh, another hill called Motorcycle Hill. And then above that is a place called Windy Corner. And here we have to wear helmets because sometimes there's rock fall and you have your ice axes out in case someone falls and slips. Everybody on the rope is responsible for making the rope stop. 
And then we have to have crampons on, which are spikes on the bottom of your boots because the snow is now icy. Um, here's the camp. This is the camp where we built these walls. This is probably our tent right here. So we're coming up the hill to continue further up the mountain. We have left our sleds in camp because now it's too steep to carry them behind us. We have to put on over boots um, over our regular hiking boots because um, the cold. And then this is the wall that I had pointed out on the map where it's very steep, it's probably, it's not 45, it's probably more like 35. And um, you, looking down, this is me in that blue shirt. Um, so it's so steep, you kind of have to stand like a duck. <coughs> and I'm bending down because there's a rope on the snow, and when you're transferring from one rope to the next rope, you've got to um, move your carabiners to the next rope, so I'm bending down and doing that. And um, there's two carabiners on the line so that if one fails, you have another one that will hold you if you slip. You cannot stop because obviously there's a line of people coming up behind you, and so you don't want to, you can't stop and take a break, and you can't eat or drink, and it's about two hours to get up to the top of that. Um, once you get up to the top of the fixed line, you're on the ridge. And um, what happens here on the ridge is this guy is in the back of the road team. He's watching to make sure that the three people in front of him, if someone slips and starts going this way, he's going to jump off the ridge this way to prevent everybody from going this way as a counterbalance. So the person in the front is very important. The person in the back is important. Um, they put me in the middle because I don't think they trusted my ability to jump off the ridge. <laughs> they weren't heavy enough. That's right, yeah, that's it. Heavy enough. Okay, so this is us heading further up the ridge. And now we're at the high camp, which is where we're going to do our bids for the summit. And we're looking down. If you look all the way back down here, that's again where we landed with the plane. So we've come up the glacier, come around, and now we're up on top. Um, this is summit day. So the between 17 and 18,000 feet, it's called the Autobahn, which is kind of a steep slope that you have to be very careful on because you've got these spikes on your shoes. You have to swing your legs wide so that you don't flip, you know, um, catch a spike on your pants. You have to make sure that you're walking properly. So you just have to be really focused and and make sure you're thinking about every step. Over that autobahn, it flattens out into what they call the football field. And then Pink Hill is this, I don't know why they call it Pink Hill, but it's the last hill. And so um, once you once you get there, you're getting close to the summit and we could see that the weather was good so we were you know you don't want to get your hopes up until you kind of get there but um, so we're on the summit ridge and um, the summit so we're going along this ridge and you can see the trail here and the summits over here and um, and then I turn around and look back down the summit ridge there's a team of, over there coming up behind us and this is the last part of the trail. Oops, sorry, I want to. Um, and this is where you finally think, I'm going to make it. You know? <laughs> After it's, this is probably day 18, and um, and you know all the work is going to pay off in just about five minutes. And so, oh, this way. Okay, so that's the summit, and. It was an extremely warm summit day. We got very lucky with good weather. I don't have my gloves on because I'm taking pictures, but I don't need it. I don't have a mask on my face. There's no wind. And it really was a perfect day for being at the summit. And the only thing that's there is this little spike that stands up that is the, um, you know, the marker for the summit. Huh. Yeah. Why okay. Does say, why does it say McKinley and not Denali? You know, when I was there, they, cha they changed the name, but I don't know if they would change the summit marker because McKinley was the name given um, by back in the 40s and 50s uh, by the U.S. government, but Denali was is the local na Native Alaskan name, and so at first they changed Denali National Park, and then they changed the name of the peak. So it was probably still McKinley back then, but I don't know if they changed the marker. Did you um, did you name your 
daughter <laughs> after Denali? <laughs> Molly's middle name is McKinley because Molly Denali sounded crazy. <laughs> 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 She's cute. Good side story there, Vince. <laughs> okay. You can see it on your first attempt. What? Prior to yes, yes. Okay, so <laughs> okay, so now we're descending the Audubon. This is the trickiest part because again, it's that steep, icy slope. These are teams that are coming up, so we're going to come down and pass them. So again, this is the time you really have to watch where you are stepping because they call it the Audubon because a lot of European climbers have fallen off this base and have. Landed at the bottom. So they can go down really fast because it's really steep and icy. Okay, we are back to camp. This is some of my teammates. I'm there in the middle. The only one with pink on. And um, so we have been going for about 14 hours. And we're back at camp and knowing that we completed the mountain. So everybody's very happy. So going down that same ridge, again, the guy in the back is watching the people in front, so he's getting ready to jump off one side if someone falls. And everybody's very tired because we had the, you know, the long summit day. But now we're back on the glacier heading towards that plain again. And um, so weather has come in and the snow has gotten soft, and so we have snowshoes on now. And it's windy, so we put on goggles, and Paul in the orange is handing out treats for everyone as they pass by. Paul is on one rope team. This rope team is coming past him, so he's handing snacks out to everybody. Everybody's sort of in celebratory mode. And then we pick up our plane, and we fly back, and Alaska has turned green in the time that, we're, that we have been gone. And this is a picture of our team um, checking into the ranger station and telling them that we're off the mountain. Mm -hmm. So you have to sign in and out. Mm -hmm. So what I didn't say at the beginning is this took me 20 years. What? Question. Oh, I had a question before we leave Denali. <laughs> yeah. So an average day, because you've got the four hours a day to camp, how many hours are you actually hiking? A, a typical day would be six to seven hours. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. that's a lot of the going back and forth. Yeah. Right? So yeah. it would be, you know, five hours up and then you just sort of run back down. Mm -hmm. And um, and some of the days just the longest day. Um, so first time I tried this was in ninety two and um, I found out just two weeks before I was going that I was pregnant with a Molly Denali. <laughs> <laughs> and my doctor said, No, you should not go. And fortunately, he did because I wanted to go. I was like, "No, I can. I feel okay." And by the time, you know, I had, I would have been up there. You know, morning sickness had set in and everything else. So, I went back in '94. Two years later, I was there a week, and I um, missed small <laughs> So I went home. So I landed on the mountain, got off, started. We walked one day, and I told my guide, "I need to go back." And so I actually had to wait in that camp until a team was coming down because you can't walk by yourself because of the crevasses. So I hooked onto another team and flew home. And then I told Molly this a couple days ago that I don't even think she missed me. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't even know I was gone. But waited 13 years. So in between had Ryan, my son, but waited 13 years, went back in 07, turned around just three hours before the summit. So we did the whole thing except for the end of the summit day and the weather turned us around. Tried again a day later and the weather still hadn't cleared. So couldn't do it that day. In 09, two years later, I was in the Anchorage airport picking up my bags, the 120 pound bags, and I hurt my back. <laughs> and so, but 2012 was where these pictures were from. So finally. And yeah, it's it's shocking that you never expect 20 years for a mountain, but I hate to give up. Okay, so this slide is back, so I figured it was time I needed to readjust my schedule because I was way off schedule. So Ed and I, as soon as the kids were old enough for us to take a vacation without them, we went to Kilimanjaro in June of 2000 and climbed it. 
And um, I expect it to be there, climb it, and then move on to the next mountain. But what happened was we were coming down, this is a picture of Kilimanjaro, just kind of beneath the summit cone. Um, I was sad, it's like I really had a good time on this mountain, I was a little sad. And you know how sometimes you get those impressions? Well, I got the impression is you'll be back. It's like, <laughs> well, what does that mean? But I, I completely heard that you'll be back. So what has happened since then is in 2001, which was the next year, went, took a team of Love Works from here, and we refurbished a primary school, and we climbed Kilimanjaro, went back in 2004 and helped build a church and climbed Kili again. Um, we visited the primary school that we built, um, so I went back last year just to check on it. I go occasionally, and those trees are the ones that the Love Works teams planted. And then as we were building the school, what happened is we were living in the village, and we saw some of the needs of the village. And what we saw was malnutrition, no work opportunities, people living off the land with really, um, you know, just dependent on what they could produce that year. And if there was a bad year, no rain, um, um, they were not gonna have any food. And so, and this is um, some ladies and their babies. So I remembered Plant With Purpose. Plant with Purpose is a nonprofit in San Diego, and they work with subsistence farmers, the same people that we had lived with in the village. And I said, would you be interested in meeting the people in this village? And they said, yes. So Plant with Purpose works in eight countries around the world, and they fight environmental degradation and rural poverty. And so they are working with farmers who their only asset is the land that they have to farm. So what they do is they started working in Tanzania in 2003, and this is a farm on right on Mount Kilimanjaro, and what they do is they teach the farmers how to get three or four times the number of crops out of their farm that they were getting before. So that, and also replant, because of what was happening is they were cutting down the trees to cook, and so you get to a point where you have your last tree. And so they're teaching them how to grow um, fast growing trees, how to install efficient stoves. And um, so out of, out of their gardens, so now that they're, um, they're growing a more um, variety of vegetables, and so since they have more, they can take them to the market. So it's not just what they consume now, but they bring it down to the market, they sell it, they have money. And what they do with their money is they teach them how to save. So each community has a savings group. They meet once a week. They deposit their savings so that they're not living on the edge. If an emergency happens, like someone in their family gets sick, they have money, they can go to the doctor. They need school fees, they can pay that. Um, they can take a loan and start a business. This is a group of ladies that now is starting a tree nursery. And so they're selling these tree seedlings to everybody in their village and in villages next to their village. And so they have a small business. And so instead of living harvest season to harvest season, they now have savings, they now have a way to make money. So that's the work of Plant With Purpose. Um, I have, let me stop this, oh I can't stop it. This is a savings, this is a savings group and I'll tell you when it's done. <laughs> Side tribe. The people in regular clothes are Plant With Purpose employees. are usually nomadic, but they're starting to um, um, settle and start agriculture. So they started a savings group with this uh, village, and we went for their first year celebration. So they got all decked out for us and did a, a dance that you just saw. 
And um, so, so now they are saving, they're growing, they're learning how to start businesses. And it was just fun to see that, you know, just participate in the dancing. So I'm gonna finish with a Tanzania story and, and then just tell you what's next for me. So in 2008, I took a group to climb, to climb Kilimanjaro. We had uh, one of our climbers was named Barry. He told me before the trip that he was fighting cancer and uh, he had to take chemo on the trip, but he didn't want me to tell the other group members because he didn't want them to treat him any differently than anybody else. So he went and saw the work of Plant With Purpose. He planted trees and he climbed Kilimanjaro, got to the top, and the last night on Kilimanjaro, he said, I'm ready to tell the group. So he told the group about his cancer and you know everybody's rallied around him. And what he told everybody was that every morning when he opened up his eyes, that he was grateful for that day to be alive because he didn't know how many days he had. And so his theme that he told us is waking up is a gift. And that really stuck with me. This is Barry planting trees with one of the school kids. That's him with an older lady. And then this is him in the crater of Kilimanjaro. We, we went up to the summit, then we went to the crater to look at the glaciers. And then he passed three years after Kilimanjaro. And so he put his son's picture of Kilimanjaro on his memorial service. And he told me um, how much it meant to him to do this adventure in the, in the last years of his life. And um, so, um, okay, I'll come back to Barry in a second, but let me tell you what is next for me. Um, on Kilimanjaro, they're trying to promote tourism, and, um, and, but the mountain is already extremely crowded. So we're trying to build a new route, and um, so I'm very excited about that. We're trying to make it very environmentally friendly, like bringing off all the waste, all the trash, all the human waste because um, right now the rest of the mountain is fairly dirty. Um, I'm continuing to work with Plant With Purpose. Um, I'm in a, a marriage and family therapy program and I hope to finish around a year from now. And um, my mom has to like this now. <laughs> and my husband. But um, so 2021, I'm hoping to do a practice mountain because I want to get almost as far as, as, as high as Everest. So um, do something that will take me up to about 27,000 feet. And then Everest would be on the schedule for 2022. And um, what I'm trying to do is follow Barry and living every day with joy. And remember that waking up every day is a gift. And that's it. If you hike it in, in 2020, will you be the oldest woman who's ever done it? <laughs> Ooh, good. Way to go, Kelly. No, that's artistic. Well, there is a chance that I'll be the oldest woman to ever do it. Well, that's stuck in that line that you saw pictures of this year mm -hmm. and because you're going to be up and down before the line and you're not going to get caught in weather so that would be my plan yeah when you reach the summit there's no guide before or in back of you and um, do people sometimes get to the summit and fall off and so how do they get saved <laughs> The, the top of Everest is, uh, you know, people come unclipped because it's not, it's fairly big. You know, it's probably like as big as these five tables right here. The, you know, I've seen 15 people up on top. Oh, Denali. Denali you can unclip too because there are no crevasses up there and you're not going to fall anywhere. So once you're in that, in the, when you're on that summit space, you're okay. There's enough it, room to yeah, maneuver around. But as soon as you start, you can't start to walk down. As soon as you get off that summit um, area, you clip back up with your teammates. Yeah. Wow. How do you uh, pick the team or how is it put together? Like, 
Yeah, um, I, I, the Kilimanjaro are people that sign up with me to go. On a climb like this, most of the time I'm going with people I don't know because you sign up with a guide service. And what I would really like to do is, I tried the Everest practice one a uh, year and a half ago, and I didn't make it because I went with a guide service, made really good friends, you know, you bonded, but then everybody left. And um, I just, I lost the mental edge because all my people that I had bonded with had left. And so I didn't continue. What do you mean they left? They left the trip. Altitude problems, yeah. mental problems, uh, you know, like, uh, things like that. Um, so it's not like they were just planning on going. They, no. They had problems. You were on the yeah. 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 So the people, the two people that I bonded with closely, and because you need encouragement, you need to, someone to say, come on, let's go, you know, and like when you're running around a track or something, let's go, you know, I know it's cold, and then you do the same for them, and all those people left, and it was really, really discouraging. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about it um, for a couple days, and I stayed. And, but then when we started our summit attempt, I just said, ah, I just don't have it, so I turned around. Yeah. So that's how it's beginning, like meeting people in the trail and yeah. deciding, hey, let's do this. Yeah. yeah. Like, where did that come from? Like, yeah. yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. my, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my boss, so I left here with SAIC. My boss at SAIC was a Sierra Club hiking leader. So he got all of us to go on his trips. And then I met some people that said, hey, would you like to do some mountains? And so we did those mountains. And well, would you like to do the little higher ones? And so it just sort of grew from there. Yeah. 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 So I had a good group of friends. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Anything else? So well, thank you for coming. And um, anybody wants to go to Kilimanjaro? I'm actually going to talk to the alumni people because Point Loma might want to be an alumni I trip would. to Kilimanjaro. That would be really fun for me. Uh, do, you, do you guys have any more questions for Cindy? Like, what was the? Do you have like a quick story of somebody in the plant with purpose that, as a kid or a lady or a gentleman, that really tugged at your heart? Uh, well, you know, one thing that really tugged at my heart was we had a pastor come talk to um, come talk to us about his, the needs in his village because Plant with Purpose is sought after now because they can see how. Um, how good the work is in a village. And so the villages around want Plant with Purpose to come to them. And so a pastor came to talk to us and said, these are the needs in my village. And it was so heartbreaking for me. I don't know if this was your question, but it, it really, I, I, I couldn't talk for a couple hours. It was just so heartbreaking. He talked about the, the young adults in his village that um, um, they, there are no job opportunities, they're lost, they're drinking, um, abuse of, of women is high, and um, it was heartbreaking. And so I was like, okay, we're gonna go over that, we're going next, and so, Very is that cool. what you wanna hear? <laughs> no, I just, I know there's there's incredible stories of your hiking, but I know there's yeah. some personal touch too yeah. with, with yeah. people. Yeah, and, it, and it's great to have women, because the, the women are doing a lot of the farming in Tanzania, mm -hmm. and so it's great when they come and they tell us stories about I can send my kid to school this year because I have money to pay their school fees. Because if they don't have money, the kids are just at home and they're not getting educated. Or a lot of times the, the, the boys will go to school and the girls won't. But now the girls can go to school. And you know, instead of stopping in sixth grade, they can go to secondary school. There's some so. serious cultural shifts that are going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? So, so Point Loma brings in awardees alumni awardee every year and you can see why this award this year and it's amazing and we're, and we're proud of you so let's give her a hand I'm not sure what your plans are after this. She's here. Uh, she said she'd hang around a bit with me. What? Were you going to hang around for a bit? You yeah, said? I will. Do you anybody else to talk to Cindy? So, well done. We're okay. proud of you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.